Hey guys, welcome back to another video. So last week on Friday, I made my usual weekly market and update video and there was one comment that really stood out to me. Now I'm not going to read the comment, but I am going to summarize it. Basically, this gentleman said that bringing real data is extremely important to understanding the market, but bringing some hope without those smoke and mirrors is equally as important. At first, I misunderstood the comment and I thought that what this gentleman was asking for was moral support. And right away I had a block. I was like, I'm not ready to give moral support to anyone in this situation because this is a situation where having a little bit of a fire under your butt is what will benefit you. While moral support can really create an illusion of everything is fine, we shouldn't change much or we should just change a little bit and that's just not serving anybody. But then I was corrected and what this guy really wanted was he wanted some solutions, some tips and tricks on actually being able to surviving the current market just the way it is some encouragement. And of course, this was the thing that gave me the idea to make this video. Thank you, Brian, for the comment. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate that you clarified it for me. This is why I love our community so much. There are so many different opinions and perspectives. And even when I disagree, whether it's justified or unjustified, I learn something every single day. So today's topic is how do you keep afloat when the market is experiencing a significant downturn? Now, if you're new to my channel, welcome. I teach about the trucking industry, the freight market, how it affects the spot market, and I try to make sense of the current craziness we are in. So if this is a topic that interests you, feel free to subscribe and join an amazing and wonderful community of industry professionals who you will learn from every single day, just like I do. So the question of how to stay afloat in such a market is pretty subjective, right? It depends on everyone's operations. It's unique to each business and each individual. But what I'm happy to do is I'm happy to tell you what I am doing and what I'm planning to continue doing in order to survive. And of course, I'm interested in reading your thoughts and opinions on what the best steps are in order to survive this downturn. Ready? Let's go. Now, of course, cash flow is a topic that I absolutely have to start with because one thing I have learned in the four years I have been in actual business running my own company is that regardless of how profitable your business might be, if you are cash flow poor, that business is not surviving, especially in the trucking industry. Now I have a whole separate video on cash flow, why it's important, and I'll link that video in the description down below so you can watch it. But in this video, I want to chat more about how to manage it. Cash flow is basically a measure of money flowing in versus money flowing out of a business. And timing, especially in this industry, is everything. So let's start by focusing on the money flowing out and going to the board. So at the end of each month, I create this kind of spreadsheet for the following month. And I use just the numbers um, application on my MacBook. You can use Excel to do this. Basically, I put in what my cash in accounts is and then what my fixed expenses are. These are in um, green and what my variable expenses are and I overestimate them. So I'm not using real numbers for this example because I am doing it for a one truck operation, for example, but let's go through it for just a second. So let's say on the 1st of September, 20,000 is what I have uh, in cash on my accounts or on my business account. Now I know that on Friday I also have to pay uh, payroll and I also have the fuel expense which is taken out directly from my checking account, my business checking account every Friday. So I will overestimate it a little bit. We have payroll, we have the payroll fee, and we have the truck fuel. Now also on Friday I know I have a trailer payment of $709 so I put that in and on Sunday I know that I have to pay for physical damage insurance fixed expense, it never changes, of $786. So I started with 20,000. By Sunday the 3rd, I need to have $7,000 or more in cash in order to cover all of this. My total cash on Sunday is $12,953. Then I do this for the next week as well. I know that I have a truck payment of $3,450 on Friday, then the payroll and the fuel, which I overestimate more than the prior week because fuel is going up. 
and also I have the insurance for the truck liability and cargo. Now for this example, I'm pretending that brokers are not paying on time and there's no inflow of money. Now for that, again, watch that video that I'm linking down below. But basically what I always try to do is pretend that the broker is not gonna pay on time. So this is what this example is doing. So after week two, I know that by Sunday the 10th, I need an additional $10,100 in cash. And then I know that my cash provided that no broker paid is now 2,800 some dollars, which means that by Sunday, the 10th, unless brokers start paying, I just ran out of cash because Wednesday, the 13th, I need to pay off my credit card for thousand dollars. And then there are payroll and fuel expenses. And by the 24th, I'm going to be negative $6,796. So this is what I do every single month at the end of the month to understand what kind of expenses are going to be happening and how I can prepare for them. Now, this is also what I use in order to make load booking decisions. I said last Friday at the end of the video that the highest rate per mile is not the sole goal when I am booking a load. I'm looking at the gross income as well. So just looking at this example, I know that in the first week, by Sunday the 3rd, I need that $7,000 plus dollars in cash. So that means that the week before this, I will already be making decisions on what loads I will book. So if I have a choice of a $3 per mile load, which is paying $800 gross or a $2.42 per mile load, but that's paying $2,400 gross for two days. This is a one day load. This is a two day load. I'm going to choose this one right here because here I'm making $1,200 per day. Here I'm wasting my time just for $800 a day. And I know that in a week from now, I'm going to have to come up with this cash right here. Does that make sense? So basically, if you only focus on the highest possible rate per mile, you might end up in a situation where, yeah, your rate per mile average is $4 per mile with deadhead, which is absolutely fantastic, but you're just not making enough money gross in order to cover those expenses, especially the fixed ones that do not change regardless of when, where, how, and why you run. Now I know that sometimes we cannot predict or even overestimate expenses because there are unexpected ones, such as, for example, a $30,000 bill for repairs for a truck that just stopped and is not moving. What I personally do is I put those huge unexpected expenses on the company credit card because it allows me time before that credit card has to be paid off. Sometimes it gives me a month. Sometimes it gives me a couple of weeks. In either case, I buy time. That way that $30,000 expense is not ruining my cash flow right now. I'm not scrambling right now to cover it and it allows me time to figure out which steps I need to take in order to cover that expense without killing my cash flow. Now, my company credit cards is something that I'm very picky about, but my favorite one right now is the Inc. Business Premier Chase card, which offers 2% cash back on all purchases and 2.5% cash back on transactions over $5,000. That means that if, for example, I have that $30,000 expense and I put it on this credit card, I'm getting $750 back in points that I can then turn into cash. A word of caution about credit cards, and I know that we are all adults here, none of us are children, but I have seen people get swallowed up by debt. If you decide to get a company credit card, the thing I advise you to do is to monitor it like a hawk and pay off the full balance on time every time, because if you don't, those interest rates will kill you. It's easy to get a little bit more relaxed when you know that you have a company credit card with a limit of $100,000, but when it comes time to actually paying that card off at the end of the month or beginning of the month, whenever the statement is due, there's going to be a lot of crying and elbow biting, so be careful. The next thing is, of course, operational strategy. So a question for you guys. When you're booking a load, what are you looking at? Are you looking at only getting the highest rate per mile possible, regardless of miles and distance? Are you looking to get into a better market? Are you being picky with the commodity or maybe all of the above? My strategy is pretty simple. 
At this point, I know the market like the back of my hand. I know where the good areas are. I know where the bad areas are, especially for flatbeds and reefers, since these are the two equipment types we operate in the company. But more often than not, if I end up in a bad market, to get back to a good market, I'll have to take a hit on the rate per mile. So what I do is pretty simple, and I'll give you an example from last week. As you guys know, last week I was booking a load from Eugene, Oregon, and I booked it to California for my flatbed. Now, California is a pretty crappy place to end up in if you have a flatbed. There's not much there that pays well. So I was basically faced with two choices, <laughs> story of my life. Either take a hit on the rate per mile and get to a good area, or take a good or decent rate per mile to a dead area and then dead head out. Now I will always choose option two. So what I usually do is I will take a good rate per mile to a dead market and then dead head out. But the way I do my calculations is what I want to show you. So we ended up somewhere in Pomona, California. And something that I quickly realized is that flatbed carriers will always choose to go to either the South Midwest or places like Oregon and Washington for their next load. Where do these carriers try to avoid going? Well, places like Wyoming, Montana, and Colorado, because all the three of them are absolutely dead markets. So what I quickly learned is that if I wait long enough here, I can actually grab a pretty good paying load to middle of Nowheresville, Colorado, right here. So what do I do in this situation? And this is a real example. I, again, I wait and then I book a load from here in California to right here, like I showed you. It's in the middle of nowhere in Colorado, right on the border of Kansas, where there is nothing going out. But before I actually negotiate a rate, which is already starting off more decent than other rates because no one wants to go here, I start looking at the load board to see what is coming out within a 450 mile radius to understand where am I deadheading from this area next? Now, what I see is that Lincoln, Nebraska is a pretty decent area compared to this one. It's nothing fantastic, but it's workable. And this is about 400 miles away from where we deliver in Colorado. So what I do is I calculate what is the deadhead to the pickup location, plus the deadhead from the delivery location to Lincoln, Nebraska, plus the loaded miles to figure out what kind of rate do I need to cover all of this craziness. So what was the result last week? Well, from here to here, I booked a load, you know what, let me write it here. I booked a load for $3,450. This was a two day load and the rate per mile for loaded miles was $2.95 per mile from California where you can barely find anything that is over $2 per mile. Now with the deadhead to pick up and from the delivery to Lincoln, Nebraska, that added an additional 453 miles and the total rate per mile with all of that deadhead came out to $2.12 per mile. Now is $2 12 cents per mile, a good rate per mile. Absolutely not. It is not. If you're looking only at the loaded miles. However, most people who would end up here would end up deadheading anyway, because there is nothing in this market. What I did was I just made a profit doing that deadhead. Now I'm sure someone will ask, what did you get from Lincoln, Nebraska? Well, from Lincoln, Nebraska with deadhead miles, I got another load paying $2 and 40 cents per mile to Bakersfield, California. So my second advice to those booking loads is don't cross off those bad markets, but make sure you're calculating all the deadhead you're going to do, not just to the pickup. Also the deadhead you'll have to do in order to get to a better market after you deliver the load. No one said that deadhead is free. It's still costing you fuel and fuel is expensive, but that way you're not stuck in California taking a cheap load for a horrible price just to get to a better market. Again, say no to cheap freight. All right, then there is the question of reputation with brokers. But before you guys start screaming at me in your heads and in the comment section, 
Let me explain what I mean. I know it's very tempting to let brokers know everything you think about them on the phone when you're booking a load or when you already booked it, but the reality of the current situation is the following. Unfortunately, we are in a position where even the smallest issue on the carrier side can cause that carrier to lose the load. And brokers, unfortunately, have every opportunity to be picky right now because they are not scrambling for capacity. There is enough of it out there. And on top of it, carriers are making it to carrier 411 with or without reason. So be careful. Regardless of the situation with brokers or the market, good service should be a priority. And I'm talking to dispatchers, drivers, owners, operators and carriers here. Don't hold a load hostage. If the weather, road conditions and your clock permits, then try to be on time to both pickup and delivery. And if you anticipate any problems with the load when you're in transit or beforehand, keep the lines of communication open. Why do I say this? Because even though reputation and tenure with a particular broker may not mean much, I mean, you guys who read my post, you know that I spent four years building a good reputation or so I thought with a particular broker, booked a load with them and then got a call from them saying that we found a cheaper carrier, so we're removing you from the load. A good reputation can still shield you somewhat from a broker being able to say that we can't use you on this load. You guys know me. I have a lot to say about brokers and when I'm on the phone with them, I will either try to school them or I'm going to be cold but professional and distant. I'm never really trying to make them my best friend <laughs> at this point in time. I used to, but reliable service and reliable communication is something I will provide regardless of the broker I'm dealing with. So if I'm on a load, this is a priority for me regardless of what I think of the actual broker. Something I can tell you with 100% certainty is that when I call on a load, I have zero fear that the broker is going to use my reputation against me. Now, of course, they will deny me for reasons like rate being too high or for a reason like, oh, your MC is less than a year old. We can't use you when our MC is over four years old but reputation is never an issue. Basically, what I'm trying to tell you is give them less ammunition to use against you. Now, personally, what I do when a load is booked is I will let the broker know the ETA to pick up when my guy is at pickup, when he's loaded and rolling, ETA to delivery, when he's at delivery, and then when he delivered the load, I will send the bill of lading right away. Now, this does a couple of things. Number one, the more proactive I am in my communication with the broker, the less likely they're going to be bothering my guys with those crazy check calls. Number two, I'm actively helping the broker build a good rapport with his client or her client, the shipper or receiver, by providing those location updates. Now, I couldn't care less about the broker's reputation, but what that does is it in turn builds my reputation. Just last Friday, I had to book a load from Lincoln, Nebraska. Yeah, the one that we had to deadhead to with the flatbed. And the broker told me he was really friendly. I believe it's a very small brokerage. He told me just don't go falling off the load. I told him that in the four years that we have been in business, we fell off a load only once. And that was when our reefer decided to terminate its existent right before picking up a frozen load. We both agreed that regardless of who you are in the chain, whether you're a broker, dispatcher, carrier, or even shipper or receiver, an agreement is an agreement and it must be respected. Professionalism and building trust are still important. Finally, a piece of advice that I personally try to follow day in and day out is patience and speed. Now, I know it sounds kind of contradictory, doesn't it? But what I mean is sometimes there are days where we end up in a market, I open the load board and I see that every single, there's not a single load that's paying well. Every single load is paying like crap. And of course this makes me panic. And there are moments where I think that I should just book something to get out of this market the best there is right now. Yeah, panic can be really blinding sometimes, but thankfully I learned how to have patience and speed. Now, what do I mean? I mean that if we end up in a bad market, I have absolutely no issue sitting four, five, six, seven hours looking for or hoping for something else to come out that is relatively decent. But the thing is, I will never take my eyes off the load board. So basically, yes, I am sitting there for that amount of time staring at the load board and hitting refresh to refresh those loads. Now that's the patience aspect and it for sure gives me a migraine constantly. Every day I have a headache because 
looking at the screen without distraction for so long is definitely not good for your health or your eyes. But the good thing is it does pay off most of the time. What usually happens towards the second part of the day is either a stress sale comes out because the shipper had a load they have to move right now and they just found out they have to move it. And that way I get a good rate per mile because all the other trucks, they already left. Or someone falls off and I am there to book the load because again, I am staring and refreshing. So I'm the first one to call even if there is another truck waiting with me. Now, I'm not going to lie to you guys and say this works every time. There are times, it works 85% of the time, if I had to put a number on it. But the other 15%, I end up losing the day. And what happens in that case when I end up losing the day is I start looking at what the next day offers. If it's the same crap, then I'm looking at where to deadhead. So while I know that panic can really drive us and really encourage us to make bad decisions, what I recommend doing is just waiting and looking at that load board without distraction because those loads, they can pop up within one second and be gone the next, depending on whose eyes are also looking at the load board. So you have to be patient and you have to be quick. Anyway, guys, I think this video has been long enough. Thank you again to Brian for being the inspiration for this video. I hope that it gave you some tools that you can readily use in order to optimize your operations or maybe tweak something to make things a little bit more bearable in this market. Well, unfortunately, we cannot change the situation with the market. What we can do is we can adapt. Human beings are very flawed. But one thing that we do have going for us is that we are pretty good at adapting both emotionally and physically. Charles Darwin once said, and I'm going to read this to you because I love this quote, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. Wishing you all a fantastic rest of your week, and I'll see you in the next video.